I want to welcome you all to Research Plus Pizza, which is our lunchtime lecture series that's brought to you by the University of Texas Libraries and features presentations on research and collections by faculty from across the university and pizza and salad over there, courtesy of our generous program supporter, Austin's Pizza. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Eric Colleri, and I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until after his presentation. You'll notice that there's some folks over here who are recording. You can see I'm on the microphone, and he will be too. And so we want to capture your questions for the podcast. Um, you don't have to say who you are. You can remain anonymous, but we do want to capture your questions. So uh, after his presentation, if you'll just raise your hand, then I will come on over, and I will bring you the microphone so that we can get your information. Um, you also probably notice in the chair where you're sitting, there's a bit of a half sheet, and that is the feedback form, and we would appreciate it greatly if you would fill that out, and you can just leave it in your chair when you go, or you can hand it to me uh, if I'm wandering around here. We want to know what you thought of today's program. We also want to know what programming we could do in future that you think would be of interest. Tell us topics that we should address. Tell us presenters. You can suggest people. Um, that we should contact and ask to come and do a research plus pizza presentation. So help us keep it going. So it takes a lot of people to put on these programs and we are very grateful for all their help. Today's program is always made possible by the UT libraries, which brings you good resources. And also, as you see here, just a few of the extremely helpful, friendly folks who uh, are in the UT libraries helping to do programs like this for you. So how many people have been to the Ransom Center? Excellent. Okay. Bunch of three. Where's the Ransom Center? Where is it? <laughs> it's that way. <laughs> it's over that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Ransom Center is down here at like 21st and Guadalupe. It's across from Doby Mall. And it is full of amazing treasures. If you haven't been to the Ransom Center, it's got things like a Gutenberg Bible, the first photograph. And you can um, see the hours that you can go in here. They're somewhat, somewhat uh, very special to know what hours they have, and especially if you need to go into some of the reading rooms or if you need to do some of the appointment-making things. I'm not going to get into the details about that because Dr. Kaliri will talk about using the Ransom Center and its collections. Um, Things to know, though, is that they do have this page where you can look at their collections. And so you could, for example, look in detective fantasy and science fiction to follow the trail for today's information and find the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle collection and some of the things that they have there are lots. This is just one of the many cool things that are over at the Ransom Center. And so now with that, let's move on. Um, oh, you can also find things by looking in our library catalog. How about this? If you haven't tried this out, just do the keyword search for Sherlock, and then you can change the location to Harry Ransom Center. And you can see that um, it only found a few things, only 907 <laughs> things, so, you know, that you can look through. Okay, so on with today's program. Dr. Eric Kaliri is our presenter today. He holds a PhD in theater historiography from the University of Minnesota. In his position as the Klein Curator of Theater and Performing Arts, he oversees research, access, and interpretation of the Ransom Center's theater and performing arts materials. And he co-curated the 2016 exhibition, Shakespeare in Print and Performance. Please welcome Dr. Eric Kaliri. That's right. That's okay. Thank you, Roxanne. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, so how many of you have read the Sherlock Holmes novels, just out of curiosity? Excellent. How many of you have read the, the short stories, the collections of short stories? OK, a few of you. Uh, movies? Yes, absolutely. The Robert Downey Jr. movies, fantastic. Uh, the TV shows, any of the TV shows? Excellent. So obviously, uh, one of the, the reasons why we're doing this uh, today and doing this now is because of the Sherlock series that's going to be, uh, they're going to release a new uh, season. And that's always nice. So just out of curiosity, and I, this may not get picked up on the mic, but uh, I'm curious to know if, if any of you have ideas about why Sherlock Holmes is such an enduring character. It's been over 100 years now that we've had Sherlock Holmes in existence. What makes him so special? Yeah. I guess it's like way, like his deductive reasoning, the way he resolves mysteries, all the way magic. Yeah. 
So it's deductive reasoning, but it almost seems like magic, she said. So, uh, yeah, there's this sort of almost supernatural ability of, of Sherlock Holmes. At the same time, he explains it in a way that seems like pure ration, right? It's, it's, it should be obvious, yeah. the ocean. Yeah, he's an awareness of the ocean. That's a great way to put it. So yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, he, he, he has the ability to notice minutia of detail, and in being able to describe that, it encourages us to think about that kind of detail in the same way. Yeah. Well, the character of Sherlock Holmes was created in a time when forensic science hadn't really happened, and so, well, like, it was starting, and so to, at that time, he was seen like a magician, but he explained that everything was through an exact science rather Absolutely. than an art. Excellent, yeah. And we'll be talking about that, too, because this is one of the paradoxes of Arthur Conan Doyle, is that he understands that forensic scientific method. At the same time, he's one of the leading proponents of spiritualism in the late 19th century. Great. Wonderful. So uh, we'll keep going then. A uh, few of you have been to the Ransom Center. How many of you have done research in the Ransom Center collections? Excellent. A few of you. So one of, what I'm basically going to do today is just talk a little bit about Arthur Conan Doyle and talk a little bit about how the Sherlock Holmes stories came about. Uh, and then I'm going to show you some of the stuff that we have in the collections. So the Harry Ransom Center is this massive collection of humanities research materials, primary source materials in, in a library. Uh, so we actually have some of the original manuscripts, the handwritten manuscripts written by Arthur Conan Doyle for Sherlock Holmes, as well as some other, some other pieces that he's done. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the kinds of things that we have and then how you can actually access that. The Ransom Center access is really important to us. Uh, and the Ransom Center collections, anyone with a photo ID, whether it's a student ID or a driver's license, can come and do research there. So uh, like I said, we'll start with a little bit of discussion about about Arthur Conan Doyle and who he is, because to understand Sherlock Holmes in many ways is to understand the life of, of Doyle and how he sort of intersects with his characters. He was born in 1859 to a middle-class family. Uh, his family was Catholic, and eventually he, he moved away from his uh, Catholic upbringing to, uh, to focus on spiritualism, which was a major religion and uh, philosophy at the time. Uh, so Arthur's parents, his grandfather actually was a really well-known caricaturist, political caricaturist. Uh, he sort of reinvented the form and made it popular again. And uh, so he, uh, growing up, his, uh, his father was uh, deeply an alcoholic, uh, was very distanced from the family, and Doyle uh, sort of took, took refuge in other, other sort of major figures in his life. Uh, he also fell in love with stories and with fiction, and he sort of lost himself in those. He was a particularly big fan of Wild West fiction. Uh, and so you'll notice, how many of you have read Study in Scarlet, one of the first Sherlock Holmes stories? Excellent. Yeah, the whole big part of Study in Scarlet is actually about the Wild West and the sort of uh, fictionalized, uh, loose details about the trek of the Mormons out west to Utah. Uh, so. He, uh, he goes to school, he's encouraged to go to school for medicine by his mother. He doesn't really want to become a doctor, but he recognizes that uh, it's a good, stable profession, and he needs, he needs that. He really wants to be writing stories, but he's not sure he can make a career of it. So he goes to school and becomes a doctor. And while he's there, he, uh, he meets Dr. Joseph Bell, who's one of the professors there. Dr. Bell uh, is actually, uh, Doyle credited Dr. Bell as being the basis of Sherlock Holmes. He's incredibly rational. Uh, he encouraged his students to think deeply about things, to ask questions, to look at the details. And uh, he was also a cold and distant sort of professor. Uh, and a lot of his students found it very difficult to engage with him. And he actually, Doyle takes that and he writes that, that, that character, not just the analytical part of the character, but also the coldness and aloofness of his personality into the Sherlock Holmes figure. So he, uh, he maintains, his, he obtains his medical degree, and at the same time, while he's doing his studies, he starts to write. So his first piece is called The Mystery of Sasa Valley, uh, which he sort of bases uh, on a lot of detective stories at the time, and you can read this online. This is widely available now. It's a great thing, right? It's out of copyright, so it's all public domain, it's all online. Uh, so he bases this on Edgar Allan Poe, Bret Hart, some of his favorite writers uh, at the moment. Uh, but he, he generally has a hard time getting his work published. He starts creating these pieces, but he doesn't know where to place them. 
So uh, he actually, after leaving uh, medical school, he takes a sabbatical and he, uh, he goes to the Arctic. He, he joins a, a, a whaling ship uh, and goes to the Arctic. Right, why not? Uh, so he, uh, this is his, one of his diaries. Uh, this is not actually in the Ransom Center collections, but the piece on the right, which is, uh, it's called A Modern Arctic Discovery. That's a manuscript that we hold here on campus, and you could see, you could request in the reading room. So basically, uh, if you think about Sherlock Holmes being uh, based in the figure of Dr. Bell from the University of Edinburgh, uh, you can see a lot of Dr. Watson in Arthur Conan Doyle. And so uh, the sense of discovery, he's a doctor, he was in the military for a little while too. Uh, there's so many overlapping connections between Arthur Conan Doyle and Dr. Watson. Um, Well-traveled. He would, uh, Doyle would write uh, a story called Captain of the Pole Star, which was based on, on many of his adventures uh, in the Arctic. So uh, he goes back, finishes up his degree, uh, he gets licensed. He calls this his license to kill, his medical, <laughs> his medical degree. Uh, so then, uh, then he's trying to figure out what to do with his life after that. Uh, the writing thing isn't going terribly well. Um, he rents a house to, uh, to see patients, uh, but it's really a rocky start. And so in those early years, he's trying to figure out what to do. And again, this is, this is if you read the early, the early parts of the, Doyle, uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories, this is a lot of uh, Dr. Watson's sort of struggle is trying to figure out what his next steps are, and then he meets Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and then it all suddenly starts to come together. Uh, and also, too, he gets married. Doyle gets married in this time, his first marriage. His, wife, uh, his first wife would pass away uh, after a few years, and then he'd get remarried. But this parallel, too, the marriage, uh, after just establishing his practice, uh, repeats in the, with Dr. Watson in those stories. In March of 1886, uh, Conan Doyle starts writing uh, one, of, one of the first Sherlock Holmes stories. This is a study in Scarlet. How, and how many of you said you read this? A handful. Excellent. It's a really interesting story. It's a full-length uh, novel. And he publishes this in Beaton's Christmas Annual. And we actually, this is the copy that we have at the Ransom Center. So we have a first edition, original uh, not, not the book. We, have, we do have the book printed edition as well, but we have the actual magazine that it first appeared in. Uh, so A Study in Scarlet is what introduces us to the first time to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. So uh, it's, it's a really important story. Uh, you, you can also see, in, especially in the uh, printed book versions, you start to get the iconic figures of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and then he gets uh, really sort of locked down by Sidney Paget when uh, the, the short stories, the ones that become collected in anthologies, um, these get published by Strand Magazine and illustrated by Sidney Paget. So these, this is really what sort of locks Sherlock Holmes, the image of Sherlock Holmes and the hat and the, the cape, all of that, uh, into the public imagination. Doyle uh, gets a, a publicist at this time to A.P. Wyatt who, who sort of takes him out of the, the hateful bargaining of getting his work published, and finally he can just focus on the writing. And this is a big deal for him. He's still doing a little bit of medical work, he's still a practicing doctor, but he's really focusing much more on his writing. And despite everything that he would do, and he's continuing to write other stories besides Sherlock Holmes during this time, nothing really connects to the public as much as his Sherlock Holmes narratives. And it makes him angry <laughs> in some ways. Uh, so much so that he eventually, uh, and I'm not spoiling anything, he kills off Sherlock Holmes in one of the stories. Uh, he says, I want to be done with this and just end it. And the public outcry was so huge, <laughs> he had to figure out a way to bring him back to life and continue on the, the stories. So uh, that's a little bit about Doyle and about how Sherlock Holmes came to be. I wanted to show you, like I said, some of the, the material that we have in the collections relating to Sherlock Holmes. So the manuscripts, the handwritten drafts that, that Arthur Conan Doyle created Sherlock Holmes through, uh, these are dispersed all over the world. Collections and institutions have them. Uh, we have a few, a handful of them. Um, so this is the original draft for A Scandal of Bohemia, which was one of the first of the short stories. Uh, in the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. So it's beautifully bound. You can see uh, this is the first page. Um, a little bit closer. It's also what I introduces us to the character of Irene Adler. Fantastic. What do you notice about this? Anything strike you about this image? 
Yeah. Here in back. Woman, the, the woman is like on this line. Yes. Yeah. It's always the woman. The woman. Absolutely. What else? Yeah. It's very, very neat. So maybe it's like a final draft or... Or maybe he just happened to get it right on the first try. <laughs> this is a really interesting thing, and it's a great thing to see across all the Ransom Center collections, the manuscript collections of writers, is you can see process. And in Doyle's manuscripts, you do get a sense of his process, but you also, uh, this, this is actually an early draft. So he's uh, not only got fantastic handwriting, uh, and they used to teach this, right? I don't know, how many of you were taught handwriting? Just out of curiosity. Just, oh, wow, okay. So they teach you not only the letters, but they teach you the spacing. They, they teach you how to maintain lines. It's not a lined paper, but it's, it's really consistent. Uh, so there really aren't, on this page, there really aren't anything, any sort of pieces that are marked out. Um, but uh, so that gives the impression that as a writer, he's actually thinking about these things fairly well through. He has a very clear understanding of where, what he wants to say, how he's going to say it, and where he's going with the story as he's writing it. This is uh, a later page. You can see a little bit more edits. So uh, this piece here, he's adding an introduction to the sentence. What does that say? You may address me as the count, as opposed to just starting with uh, the guy just basically saying the count. <laughs> so little details like that he begins to tweak. He'll adjust maybe a word here and there, but he's, he's fairly consistent. Uh, what's also interesting about this uh, Scandal in Bohemia uh, manuscript is that the handwriting changes a few pages in. And Arthur Conan Doyle's son, uh, Ian Doyle, uh, Adrian, Adrian Conan Doyle, uh, got a chance to see a copy of this manuscript and wrote a letter to the Ransom Center in the, this is 1962, uh, and basically to explain what had happened, why the handwriting changes. Uh, at the time, uh, he was having uh, hand problems. And uh, let's see, what does it say? You may have noticed that some five or six pages not in my father's handwriting occur in the middle of the manuscript. And I thought that you might like to know that this is the handwriting of his sister Lottie to whom when my father's hand became tired, he would dictate. This happened on very rare occasions and among the family collection manuscripts, there are only two which carry one or two pages in dictation in his sister's handwriting. So he would actually, uh, he would tell the story and then his sister would, would help him write it down when his hands got tired. Uh, we have one page, one page out of the entire manuscript of the House of the Baskervilles, uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles, sorry. Uh, it's, it's, again, the manuscript pieces have been, have scattered. Uh, some of them he gave away as gifts, some of them were sold, some of them uh, he would auction off to charities. So they've really gone all over the place over the years. Uh, but again, uh, uh, you, s you get a sense of his writing style. It's mostly consistent with a couple word changes uh, uh, every once in a while. Uh, this is uh, The Adventure of the Golden Pontene, uh, which was in the Collected Stories of the Return of Sherlock Holmes. So we actually have the full notebook for this. Uh, and that's available in the reading room as well. This is part of uh, what's called the Arthur Conan Doyle Papers. It's a collection of, of all the papers that we have. It's not just papers either that we have. We have a lot of his personal effects and furnishings. This is Arthur Conan Doyle's desk, uh, which uh, is not on public display. It's actually in the office of the British uh, Studies Department in the Ransom Center building. It's on the third floor. Uh, but this is where uh, the desk that he used. Uh, we also have a wicker chair, we have some of his golf clubs, uh, we have clothing, these, this is his socks, a pair of his socks. And what's actually interesting about these socks, these are the socks that he died in. Because uh, there's this note, this note from his wife, the socks which were on my beloved's feet, put on by the nurse after he had passed on, in which I took off and replaced others with my own hands. Uh, there was this sort of tenderness, right? She didn't want him to be buried in sort of grungy socks. <laughs> she, wanted, she wanted him to be buried in, in nicer socks, so she, she changed them uh, after he died. Um, there's also, so there's, there's other things too. We have uh, some of his clothes, we have a pair of his eyeglasses. These things seem strange, but uh, it's a really important way for an archive, right? You can get the books. You can buy Sherlock Holmes in any bookstore. You can download it off the internet for free. Uh, but to see the original manuscripts and to be able to touch the things that he touched gives you access to the person, right? It connects you in a way that 
a digital facsimile or a book uh, or, or you know, mass market paperback or something like that doesn't give you the same sense of access, the same sense of connection. So that's really important for us. That's what we do. That's what's unique about an archive. Uh, also with his collection is uh, a lot of his papers actually deal with his interest in spiritualism. Uh, he was a great spiritualist. Uh, he uh, basically um, believed not only uh, in, in the afterlife, but the ability to be able to connect with that afterlife in the current life. Uh, so this could be done through spirit photography, for example. And we have a large collection of his personal photographs and spirit photographs, his fairy photographs as well. Um, and even though people like Harry Houdini, whose archive we also have at the Ransom Center, would say, I know exactly how that's done and I can show you, I can prove it, I can debunk it. Uh, Doyle, who created Sherlock Holmes, right, the most rational detective, right, the one uh, who can really pick these things apart, uh, Doyle can't help but believe it. It's a fascinating paradox. Uh, we have, like I said, Harry Houdini's papers. This is one of uh, the personal photographs in the Arthur Conan Doyle collection of Doyle and Houdini. They were actually good friends in life even though they disagreed on this huge fundamental uh, issue. Uh, they, there's several letters actually between the two of them in the collection. This is a copy of Houdini's death certificate. Harry Houdini actually died 90 years ago yesterday uh, on Halloween. Uh, and Doyle insisted that uh, even though Houdini had died, he was still, uh, his spirit was still around and that you could connect with him. And he wrote a book about this actually. Uh, so, uh, accessing the collections. Real quickly, I just want to show you how you do this. How do you, how do you get to go to the Ransom Center and actually see these things? Like I said, it's available to anybody with a photo ID. Whatever, passport, student ID, driver's license, doesn't matter. So, we're on the corner of 21st and Guadalupe. Uh, that's the outside of the building. That's what it looks like. That's the reading room. Uh, so, basically, you come in, you show your ID. It's on the second floor to the reading room staff and they will send you into a little room where you're going to create an account. It's really easy to do. It takes about 10 minutes altogether to set up the account and then to watch a seven minute handling orientation video. So all of this stuff is really rare, priceless, right? You're gonna be handling a manuscript of Sherlock Holmes. We wanna make sure that's accessible to people a long time from now. So we do uh, offer some instructions about how to handle it just to make sure that it's, it's cared for. Uh, so, oh, yep, let me. I'm going to switch to the internet real quick. Uh, so this is our website. It's hrc.utexas.edu. Just to give you a sense of, of how to find these things, uh, you can go to the guide to the collections. Uh, and again, there's the detective, fantasy, and science fiction section. This gives you a real, the guide to the collections give you a really great overview about all the kinds of things we have. I mentioned the Houdini archive, I've mentioned Doyle's papers, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've got so much more. Uh, so to actually see what we have of Arthur Conan Doyle's, you'll go to research and then finding aids. And then under collection name, it'll bring a A to Z list of all the finding aids in the collection. So we'll just go to Doyle's real quick. And there we are. So you'll see that we have both his papers, which is the one with the little camera next to it. And then we have the literary file of photography collection. That's the index of his photographs, his personal photographs that we have. So if you click on the collection, again, this is the paper portion of it. It's about 19 boxes plus uh, oversized materials. So you can actually go through the whole list. It starts there, it's alphabetical, starts with works. All of this stuff is the handwritten works section. Then it goes into correspondence, letters, all that. And then uh, at the bottom, which is really interesting, and never forget to look at this, no matter what archive you go to, the miscellaneous section is always a treasure trove of really uh, overlooked stuff. People usually just look at the works, maybe dig into the correspondence. Um, so yeah. Uh, so basically, from here, uh, you click on whatever it is that you want. You can request a folder, you can request an entire box and then hit Request Checked Items. It's gonna take you into a login page. You'll have already created your account, uh, and basically you log into your account and it adds it to that. You go to the reading room staff on the second room floor. You say, hey, I've just requested some boxes. Within 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how many staff members we have and how bu busy the reading room is, they'll go into the stacks, get it for you, and bring it out for you to look at. Pretty amazing, right? So that's not all. Uh, we also have books. Uh, so 
there's a couple tricks. If you go to the UT Library catalog, uh, you can, I always go to the advanced catalog search just because there's a little bit more flexibility. You can go to the Ransom Center, limit it by the Ransom Center. You can go to, oh, not title, subject. And you can do Sherlock Holmes. And it'll pull up all 175 related books just in the Ransom Center holdings that connect to Sherlock Holmes. Another trick that I love, uh, and again, not too many people know about this, and it's a neat little trick that you're getting. You're getting it today. You can go down here to browse by former owner. And you can see that we've actually got over over 1,841 <laughs> books that were formerly in the library of, of Arthur Conan Doyle. It's pretty amazing. So you can actually, we have a big chunk of his library here. You can, you can look at the books that he looked at. If you want to read not just Edgar Allan Poe, but the Edgar Allan Poe that Arthur Conan Doyle read to, that influenced a lot of his writings, you can do that at the Ransom Center. Basically, you, you go to the record, and you click Request Item, and it'll bring you to your login screen. Make sense? OK. So that's, uh, that's what I got for you. Um, let's see. Oh, no, one more thing. I'm so sorry. There's one more thing. If you can't, or, or for whatever reason, are skittish about going in and looking at the actual manuscripts, <laughs> We do actually have digital collections as well, including uh, all of our Sher a lot of our Sherlock Holmes material, not all of it, but some of our Sherlock Holmes material has been digitized and put on our website. So if you go to the main uh, page under collections, you'll see a link for digital collections. You scroll down to, it's going to be on the left-hand side here. Where is it? Where is it? It's a lot of stuff up online. So you can actually, if you wanted to go through the manuscripts from home, you can actually just click on any one of these things and flip through the pages. The Detective of the Future, for example. It's a seven-page manuscript. And you can zoom in, make it full screen, all that good stuff. Cool? Cool. Hopefully we'll be seeing you in the reading rooms. Uh, so. Uh, like I said, that's what I've got. But if you have questions about any of this, you can ask. Yeah. OK, please hang on, and I'll bring you the microphone for your question. What's your favorite uh, Sherlock Holmes book? That's a great question. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I really do like The Study in Scarlet, just because it's the first one, and it sets so many of the themes up. Scandal and Bohemia is pretty great, too. But I can't. I think they're all pretty good. The ones that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote himself, uh, then there were all these sort of post-Doyle post stories. Uh, and now the copyright's cleared, so actually anybody can write a Sherlock Holmes story without impinging on copyright. So, uh, but, but that's probably my favorite. So you were talking about the contradiction between him believing in spiritualism and writing this analytical Sherlock Holmes character. Um, do you think he got frustrated with Sherlock Holmes because of that contradiction, and that's why he decided to kill him off? That's a great question. Uh, maybe. Maybe, absolutely. Uh, I think oop, I think he, uh, it's probably, there we go. Uh, I think he, uh, I think he was frustrated because he was such a popular, he saw him as a, uh, a work of fiction, and uh, he was frustrated because he was getting pinned down to only being able to do Sherlock Holmes stories. But at the same time, there is something really interesting in that, right? That he's such a different kind of a character uh, that he, that somehow the two, the two Doyle and Sherlock Holmes and their way of, their brain works, even though clearly Doyle's brain has to work the same way because he's, he's writing Sherlock Holmes, somehow they don't connect. Um, part of it is that Doyle's son was killed in the war and uh, he went to consult a medium and basically uh, the medium tried to bring him back to life and made it seem like uh, his son's voice 
was heard in the room and that uh, he was actually, his son's spirit sort of brushed against his forehead. And he believed that. He believed that immensely and wanted and needed to believe that actually so much so that even when people would, like Houdini would come to him and say, I can recreate that, I can show you how that happened, uh, he, couldn't, he, he couldn't and wouldn't believe it. Other questions? Yeah. So I kind of went down a rabbit hole the other day looking um, at stuff about Charles Altamont Doyle. Are there any of his materials included in Sir Arthur's Conan Doyle stuff? That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but the, the, catalog, the collection's actually fully cataloged. So uh, everything that you'll see on the finding aid is what we have. And I think actually at the very bottom of the list, always look, again, all the way down to the bottom of the finding aid, I think there's an index to correspondence, so you'll be able to see uh, who shows up in the letters. Yeah, there's a question up here in the front. Um, how do you feel the uh, at TV and film adaptations of Sherlock Holmes have evolved over time, especially since it's like more and more time has passed since the original stories? Yeah, that's a great question too. Uh, so like any piece of artwork or theater or film that keeps coming back, I think it's always theater, and I'm theater, right? I work in theater. Theater, theater doesn't exist in a vacuum. So when it gets picked back up again, you'll notice that with each adaptation of Sherlock Holmes or with each uh, variation, you know, sometimes it can, it, the story can be dramatically altered. Uh, with each one of those, you'll notice that it takes on the flavor of the given moment. And there's a commentary on that. So the Benedict Cumberbatch series that's out right now, why? What is it doing? It modernizes it, right, for one thing. But it also, it brings the analytical mind of Sherlock Holmes into the 21st century. And it asks us to think, what, what is the contribution of Holmes then in the 21st century? What could a mind like that do in the age of terrorism and you know, chemical warfare and biological warfare, which he deals with up until now, he's dealt with in, in all of this, the seasons so far. So it's gonna be interesting to see then what how do they take the stories? Because they are based still on the original Arthur Conan Doyle series. There was that great one with uh, Russell Tovey uh, with the Hounds of the Baskervilles, right? Remember that one? Where uh, it becomes less about, the, it's still this, about this imaginary hound, but then it becomes in the TV show about uh, a government project, basically, to create this chemical that makes people hallucinate and see things that are dangerous that aren't really there. One more. One more. Um, are there any like maybe personal entries of Conan Doyle's like when he's writing when he's killing off Sherlock Holmes mm. like anything that you would see like any logs or journals and then also is there any way to see that desk because it's not uh, yeah uh, so uh, we'll hopefully have the desk on display at some point in the future. Uh, we do exhibits on a regular basis, but the personal effects parts of the collection are, because of their fragility and, and difficulty to, to handle, bringing a desk into the reading room can be really tricky. We do have Edgar Allan Poe's desk, though, on display in the second floor reading room. So anybody, if you set up a, reading, a research account, you can go into the reading room and see Edgar Allan Poe's desk. It's a beautiful desk, uh, and that's in the back corner, so check that out. Um, we do have personal... Uh, 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 manuscripts in there too that you'll notice in the finding aid there's some journals and diaries. I don't know if they actually speak really, I think it's earlier than when he killed off uh, Doyle, or Holmes, but, uh, but do take a look. There's also a lot of his writings, his personal writings have been published in other places, so uh, if those diaries exist out there in someone's collection they may have been published. Awesome, I think that's, that gets everybody. No questions about researching or anything like that? You're going to come visit, right? How many of you are going to come stop by the Ransom Center? Excellent, excellent, wonderful. There's so much more. So Doyle, Doyle and Sherlock Holmes are just the tip of the iceberg, but if that's what gets you in, we're so, so happy to have you. Thanks for coming today, too.